1 Peter 4.10, tonight's memory verse, as each one has received the gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 1 Peter 4.10. Anybody else know it tonight? It's a little bit harder than normal for some reason. I don't know, but I should, but I'll read it. You'll read it? Okay, go ahead. 1 Peter 4.10. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. First Peter four ten. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Well I can read it too. First Peter four ten. As each one has received a gift, serve one another as good trustees of manifold favor of the Almighty. First Peter four ten. Good job. Manifold favor. Yep, that's what grace is. Divine favor. Anybody else? 1 Peter 4, 10. Well, let's look at it then. Um, Context is kind of in serving. We're all called to be servants. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give His life a ransom for many. That's what you and I are called. So many people in the body of Christ today, uh, they, they don't understand that each one of us have been given a gift or gifts that, that God gives us. And that's what this says. As each one has received the gift. Have you received the gift? Well, I don't know, Greg. I don't know what my gifts are. Why not? Why not? Because the Bible clearly tells us as Christians that we've been given gifts. That God has not just given us salvation. That's a gift also. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But he's also given us gifts. And we're supposed to be ministering that gift or gifts. Some people have multiple gifts. And you can be used in all of the gifts that are of the Spirit. Now, you can can be used in any of them at any time if you're a willing and available servant. And you're wanting to do the glory of God. You're wanting to be there to glorify God. In fact, he goes on to say, listen to me because we'll get some context. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what he really tells you in context is that all of the gifts that are given are in two categories. There's the speaking gifts where you might be a preacher or a teacher or an evangelist, or you might give a word of encouragement or a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, you're speaking. And then there's the ministry gifts where you're serving. So there's other gifts where you do service to others. There's the gift of helps. There's the gift of administration. There's a lot of these gifts that are enumerated in the Bible that God shows us. And I'm not convinced that any list in the Bible is completely thoroughly finished because I believe God gives gifting for the area, gifting for the body, gifting for what that person and that body needs. So, uh, but I believe that they're pretty well honed in when you start to look at, uh, and this is your homework, if you would look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Now the word gift is not used in 1 Corinthians 12. I want to tell you that, but it's called spirituals because it's, it's called, uh, but in the King, New King James, the word gift is in there, but it's not really there um, in the original Greek. The word gift, though, is the word charisma. Think about that, because we use the word charisma in a little bit different way. But it means a divine gratuity or a spiritual endowment. In, 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 in um 1 Corinthians 12, it's called a spiritual. Now, each one has been given a spiritual. And, and that's because it's a miraculous faculty to be used in the body of Christ. Not all of us have the same gifting. 
Not all of us are the same. Just like my, my body's not all the same. It has many parts. And that's what he says. We're members individually. And we have gifts that are different. Not everyone is a nose. Not everyone is a mouth. Not everyone has a speaking gift. Some have other gifts that also edify and build up the body of Christ. And so, but this is what he wants us to understand in our memory verse. Peter, as each one has received, it means to get a hold of. It's been offered to you. It's freely given by God. Lord, here I am. Thank you for my salvation. That was a gift. But now, Lord, what was it that you created me for? Well, let, I'm glad you asked that. Let's go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. I might even spend a lot of time on this. I'm not sure yet. But this is a very important part because much of the body of Christ today, they go to church and they go, they go, uh, teach me, pastor. They go to church and they say, uh, 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 hey, how about play some music to me? Hey, how about, how about you guys entertain me and I'll go home and I've done my spiritual service and I'm done for the rest of the week. But we're not called to set down we're called to be equipped on Sunday, equipped at the Bible study, equipped in the throne room of God to go out for the work of the ministry, to tell others the good news of Jesus. Now, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, we have some very interesting information that Paul gives us through the power of the Holy Spirit. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, right? It's not works. You can't work your way. You can't climb a ladder. You can't dig enough holes. You can't tell enough people to get saved. But you can freely receive the gift of salvation when you believe in the finished works of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. That is blood paid for your sin nature. Look at John 6, 29. What must we do to be saved? Believe in him whom God has sent. Believe in the blood of Jesus. But look here at verse 10. For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, let's make up some good works then. No, 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 no. No, no, we're not making up any works. They're already created for you. God knows what he's called you to do. He knows what labor and work you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be the, doing the ministry of reconciliation of souls. Well, how do I do that, Greg? Well, God has given you a gift. He's given you a supernatural spiritual enablement, at least one gift. And with that gift, as you come to the throne room, you talk to God, you find out what kind of service, whether it's speaking or it's ministry with service and waiting on people and encouraging people, and you begin to use it to minister to one another with the manifold grace of God. You begin to hone in on it, and God begins to train you in it. And it's always done with the Word of God, by the strength of God, for the glory of God. We're not, we're not supposed to just be going and showing up to church and then leaving. We're supposed to be learning this relationship with God, learning this relationship with the Father who we're going to be brought back to and delivered to, with the Son, whom we're going to be married to for eternity, and with the Holy Spirit, who is training us and teaching us and guiding us now in all of the work of the ministry. He is our supply. He is our strength. He's the one that gives these supernatural enablements, which is what it says in 1 Corinthians 12. The Holy Spirit gives to each person as he sees fit. It's not something that, now listen to me, because you might say, well, if I'm going to have a gift, then I want to give to speak, and I want to be the pastor. No, you don't. Let me just tell me, just let me just tell you clearly, you don't want to be the pastor. But if God gives you a speaking gift, or he calls you to be a pastor, then you want to be. But you don't want to figure out how to do it on your own. Because see, the reason people all over the place are burning out, wearing out, falling away, giving up their apostate is because they're trying to do something that they inspire to do. I want to be that. I want to do that. I want to have this career. But it's not what God has called you to. See, you want to go boldly to the throne room to obtain mercy and find grace, the spiritual needed. 
You want the grace that God has given you. What he has created you for. Because you, you have been given a gift. And you want what he has. And then with his supernatural enablement, you will not wear out. You'll be able to perform that gift and, and, and administer that gift to one another. So that they can grow in the grace and the knowledge of you. You don't want to make it up. You'll be wore out. You'll be beat down. Why? Because we're his workmanship. That's the word, the Greek word poema. We're works in progress. It's where we get the word poem from. We're a prose that God is He's already written, and now He's performing it in our lives if we will surrender and allow Him. And He created us in Christ Jesus to do these good works. You don't make up good works. The good work is that people would hear the good news that Jesus Christ died and poured out his blood. That's the good work we're doing. Now, it might look different. It might be that somebody spills something in a restaurant and you jump up to help them because you're a servant. Not because you're looking for attention. You're an attendant. You're, you're, you're a table waiter. Look, that's what it means, actually. To minister, to be an attendant, to wait upon, to be a deacon, a minister, or a slave, a servant to others. So that they will see that you're surrendering your life for his service. That they will know you by your love for one another. It's the one another ministry. Notice that. Ministering to one another. That is missing in the body of Christ today. All of my members of my body minister to my body. Everything in my body is ministering to the rest of my body. It all works together. When it doesn't, we call it a malady. When it doesn't, we call it cancer. When it doesn't, we call it some type of, of, of an injury. My body, every bit of it is there for a purpose. And God knows how to put the spiritual body together in each place. And he puts them there on purpose. And he don't put 17 mouths in one building. See, so there's, there's positions and places. And Christ is the head of all of them. And as Christians... We are supposed to be spending time with God, spending time in the word, prayer and fellowship and asking, what is my calling? What is my ability? What are the spirituals you've given me, Lord? And then you just do the natural thing, the natural thing that the spirit would have you do. If you see something before you, you don't step over the trash. You pick it up and you put it in the receptacle. You don't stand around while everybody else is working and look at them and do what you want to do. When it's time to work, it's time for everybody to work. You know, and a lot of times people, I, I, I was uh, listening to David Rosales, who's a pastor in the movement, and he said that this one guy told, come up to him and told him he was a servant, and he was, you know, he was called to serve and to help, and he wanted to just come alongside. And, do, and then meanwhile, David is stacking chairs. He stacked over 200 chairs while the guy told him what he was going to do. And he never had touched one of the chairs. And he stacked over 200 chairs. And he's talking about being a servant. And he wants to work and he wants to serve others. And David never said a word to him. But how a person can, can aspire to be anything. But it's naturally, supernaturally built in you by God. And all you have to do is ask him and then begin to do it. And then begin to ask him to help you do it. Notice, when he's, notice what he says. You are his workmanship. We're in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and 10, 2, 10. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. It's already prepared. It's already a gift that's been wrapped. It's like, it's like a, 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 a birthday, and there's the package. It's already been wrapped for you. God knows what it is. It's a supernatural enablement. Do you know what the gift is in your life? Do you know what you're called to do? And you should be wanting to do it, because you know why? you'll flourish in it. If it's encouragement, if it's praying, if it, whatever it is, whether it's speaking or service, God will give you supernatural power through the Holy Spirit to do it if you go to do it for His glory. Back in our 1 Peter 4.10, notice um, we have received it, this gift, uh, we're to minister it, serve one another with it, be looking to give ourselves away as Christ did, one another, other people around us. The, gift, the, the ministry is not to, to, to draw attention to you. It's to draw attention to Christ. 
you can do it in your flesh and not wear out. Um, God probably didn't bring you to it. It's probably something you made up and you want to do. You were educated for it, but it's not from God. So be very careful what you're doing. As good stewards, you know what a steward is? It's somebody that takes care of somebody else's property. God has given you a gift, and it's his property still. And he wants you to minister to others with it. A steward is a house distributor. It's a manager. It's an overseer. The word can be a treasurer. See, like we're treasurers for God. He's given us all these riches in earthen vessels. And we can go give the good news of the riches of Christ Jesus, the inheritance, and tell others about it. Because we're stewards of God's economy. Stewards of God's property. Stewards of God's gifts. And we all work together to give this news to other people so they can come to salvation. It's like there's this storehouse in heaven. Think of about it like this. And, and we go there and come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And he teaches us and he changes us and he fills us with his spirit. And we go out and give it to others. Now let's look at it on the pages of scripture. Jesus feeding the 5,000. What happened? He, he instructed the disciples. They followed the instruction. Then what did they do, Greg? They came back to Jesus. He gave them bread. Then what did they do? Then they went out and gave the bread to the others. And when they were out, they come back to Jesus again. And they went back and forth, getting supernatural uh, uh, instruction, supernatural provision, and then going and obeying it. But you have to keep coming back to the throne. You have to keep being filled up. There's nothing that we have that is our own. We're going to the storehouses of heaven. We're coming to God for provision. We're trusting in Him for our strength. It's not from us. In fact, he actually says that in the text. The word ability. The word ability there is uh, power, strength, and might. It's, it's not our ability. It says if in verse 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. So you're speaking the utterance of God, the words of God. You're speaking for God to others. If anyone ministers, you're serving others for God. Let him do it with the ability, the power, strength, and the might which God supplies or giveth. Listen to this. It, the word giveth or supplies can be to be a dance leader. Isn't that interesting? That the word is giveth in the King James. It's supply in the New King James. And it means to be a dance leader. You're leading. See, we're supposed to be following. But God is the leader. He's the one that giveth the gift. He's the one that giveth the strength. He's the one that, here it is, furnishes. He furnishes us with everything we need to administer to give to other people, whether it's in speaking or whether it's in service, whether it's, it's, it's no matter what that gift might be. And you can look at the gifts. You can go back over to Romans. Let's just go there. Romans 12. In fact, this might be all we do tonight because this is very important because church has become pew setters. Church has become entertain me. Church has become do for me. Church has become, well, I don't like that preacher and I don't like that part of it. Church is the called out ones that are following Jesus Christ. And we come together to get equipped. And we're going to go there in a minute. Romans 12, verse 3. Paul, still speaking to the church in Rome, says, For I say... Through the grace, through this gift given to me. See, he's got a speaking gift. He's got a pastor, teacher, evangelist. He's going as a, as a missionary. He's writing a letter here, and it's part of the speaking gift. He's trying to encourage to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Listen, being sober-minded, don't get puffed up in knowledge. Don't get puffed up because you believe a little different or you're a little further in your growth. 
Don't get puffed up about your life. Take heed, you who think he stands, lest he fall. Be sober about it. Don't be drunk with what you think you're doing or what you think you're knowing because it's been given to you by God. If you have anything, even the breath, physically or spiritually, God knows about it. And God can take it. All you have to do tonight when you go home, just say, this is my car, God, and you can't have it. He'll take it. You need to be thankful for it. Don't challenge him. Surrender to him. Be sober about everything that you have and all that is his because you are a steward of his stuff. And if he blesses you with it, you should be using it for his glory. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, different functions. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. See, we're all joined together. We're going to go there in a minute. We'll see that. We're part of the same body of Christ and he is the head. He gives the power, the strength, the might. He gives the instructions. He's the one that died for us. He's the author and the finisher of that faith that we've all been given a measure of. Having then gifts, here it is, verse 6, differing according to the grace, the measure of grace that is given to us, let us use them, let us minister them, if prophecy... Let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, prophecy there is not necessarily outside of Bible prophecy. This is prophecy and foretelling the word of God, foretelling the word of God, which includes when you look at scripture, telling people what God has already said he's going to do. And and God will give you supernatural understanding of what the word of God says. And if if you actually have this gift, you might be able to tie together. There are those who have the prophetic uh, seating where it's, it's the gift of prophecy. And they begin to look at the times and they can foretell the times, tie it to the scriptures. But most of them that know anything never say, thus saith the Lord. They say it looks like this. And this is what Ezekiel 38 says and Isaiah 17 says. And they begin to show you what God said he's going to do. But we need to keep our eyes fixed on the gift that God has given us and minister that gift to others so that they can come to salvation. And one of the most important ones is prophecy or foretelling the word of God. Because this is what changes us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Not by something extraneous and outside of the Bible. This is what he's given us right now. Coupled with the spirit to wash us and cleanse us. And prepare us as a bride adorned for the groom who's coming soon. Are you being washed and cleansed with the washing of the water through the word? Holy Spirit and the Word. When you confront it with the Word, do you become a doer and not a hearer only? That's how we get washed. That's how we get cleansed. Washing happens when you go, okay, that was dirty, wasn't it? That was wrong. And now the Word of God told me and the Spirit of God told me, now give me some strength, power, might to obey it because I see in me nothing to perform it. So you can't perform Salvation. You can't perform the work of God apart from the Spirit of God. Paul said, wretched man that I am. The thing that I want to do, I don't do. The thing I don't want to do, I do. Who will save me? I thank my God for Jesus Christ. Listen, our our calling is to recognize that there's nothing good in the flesh. Our calling is to recognize that, that in our weakness, He is strong. Our calling is to recognize He's the one that gives the gifts. He didn't just give salvation. It's a gift, but He gave us gifts that we can go minister to one another. But it all has to be done according to His ability, His power, His might. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Everything. When we come and surrender and realize that apart from Him, we're nothing. We're nothing. So that any of the supernatural, all of it, the whole spiritual life has to be done in complete submission to Him. 
When we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, He lifts us up. When we draw near, He draws near. He's waiting. So having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Some are going to prophesy differently because they have a measure of faith that God gave them. But just because one person prophesies and foretells a little better than this one doesn't mean they have different positions in the kingdom of God. The ground is level at the cross. You have to always remember that God's the one that gave that insight. God's the one that gave that gift. God's the one that come with that calling and then enabled that person to be able to do that work. It's not the person. It's God. Keep our eyes fixed on God. He's the one that calls. He's the one that ministers. Verse 7, or ministry, again back to service, speaking in service. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, and all the gifts really are supposed to be for exhortation, to build one another up. We don't have anything of our own. It's given by God, from God, for the, for the glory of God to encourage and build up the people around us and minister to one another. That's what we're doing here right now. What is it, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25? And let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but encourage one another, or stir one another on to love and good deeds, uh, uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. Went around backward there in these two versions, didn't I? But that's what we're doing. You know, it's encouraging when I see faces on Sunday morning or on Wednesday night or on Friday night. It's encouraging. And it's encouraging to other people when they see your face and you should be there to encourage them. We're not coming just to go, teach me, feel me, look at me. It's all about me. No, that's the flesh. We're coming to minister our gift to other people and to love on them and to encourage them and make them better parts of the body because when you make them better parts of the body, it's going to strengthen you. It's going to make the whole body stronger. Where the, and, and then the head is Christ where all the supply comes from. Okay, so we exhort you in the exhort, exhortation, giving. If you give, give with liberality. Look at that. One of the gifts is giving. There's a gift of giving. I got a buddy that always says he has the gift of receiving. You guys know him, Neil Hervelli. And when you give, you give with liberality. He who leads with diligence. Listen, listen, when God calls you to be a leader, a pastor, you, you got to be diligent in it. You can't just go, oh, I'm leading them haphazardly. Well, they'll haphazardly fall off a cliff. But listen. It's not the leader that's faithful. It's the spirit that's faithful. It's actually one of the fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. So who does the supplying of any faithful leader? God does. There's nothing in me that can be faithful. There's nothing in you that can be faithful. But if you look for him to supply and be the ability, then he can make you faithful. But you have to depend upon Him. In fact, the entire life is a dependency upon God. Prayer is dependency upon God. Faith is depending and trusting that God's going to do all He said He would do. And He always has, always will, and He's never been known to be a liar because there's no lie in Him. So, giving with liberality, leading with diligence. He who so shows mercy with cheerfulness. I'm not going to punish you this time. But you deserve it. No, cheerfulness when you give mercy. God's not in heaven giving us mercy, which is where salvation comes to. His mercy, which provided grace, and then by faith we receive it. He's not up there going, I should have snuffed them out. No, he desires a relationship it's his will that all would come to salvation. In fact, he did it so much that he gave us his most prized possession, his son. And knowing that if we would just trust and obey and become servants as he is and listen to the spirit and surrender and know that we can't do anything. Not one good thing dwells in the flesh. Then that we could be conformed into the image of his son. As many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. 
Okay, let's look at Ephesians 4. We were in 2. We found out we are his workmanship. But look at 4. Now, now, Paul was writing to the church in Ephesians in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. And, and, and any Christians there now are being persecuted or underground. They're not even allowed to, to, to do what they were doing then. Look at this here. Here again, we have a little um, section here, 411, and we see the equipping gifts. The equipping gifts are what prepares us and brings unity in the body of Christ through the Spirit. And he gave, and he himself gave some to be apostles. That's people that are sent forth, missionaries we might call them today. Uh, some prophets. That's foretellers. That's those that can see the signs of the time we just discussed. Some evangelists. See, we're all called to be witnesses. Go, therefore, and be witnesses. But some people have a gift of evangelism where they can spread the gospel with anybody. That's one of the speaking gifts. Some pastors and teachers. All speaking gifts. Well, what are they for, Greg? What are these equipping gifts for? For the equipping of the saints. For the work of the ministry. Why would you equip the saints? So they can do the work of the ministry. There's a ministry? There's service? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Well, what's that for? Why would I do the work of the ministry? So that I can encourage and edify the body of Christ. That's what we do with our gift. That's what Peter's talking about. You want to build up the body of Christ to do the work of the ministry so we can see other souls saved. 13, what, how long? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Right? So for the rest of our lives here, till we see Christ face to face, we're supposed to be working this ministry out so there's those that god has called to be uh, uh, uh equippers with the speaking gifts with the teaching gifts with the evangelist gifts and there's those that are serving and we're all trying to grow in the knowledge of the son of god we're trying to come to unity in the faith we're trying to become perfect children of god and become more like Christ, the fullness of Christ. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit's doing? Conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to be cooperating with. Well, 14 says, what? That we should no longer be children. Are you? How long have you known Christ? Think about this. This is a test. How long have you known Christ? Are you still a child in your faith? Are you still on the milk? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit? Are you following the Holy Spirit? Do you know your gifts? Are you looking to encourage others or still living your own life? These are, this is not to condemn. This is to equip. It's to call us out. It's to wake us up. That's what the Word of God does. It steps on your heart. It, it, it confronts you with love. It speaks to you face to face. And at your conscience, you have to make a decision. Here I am, Lord. That's me. I haven't been doing what you called me to do. I surrender. Can you give me the power, the strength, the might, the wisdom to do what you called me to do? We're not supposed to stay children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Look what it by. Where does every wind of doctrine come? Where does all the waves come from? The trickery of men. It's the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. See, they're trying to build their own little kingdoms. They're trying to make up their own little traditions. They're trying to tell you what religion looks like and what religiosity is and what we should be doing. What has God told you to do? Which body of Christ are you supposed to be with? What part of the body are you? God wants to reveal these things. If He's not revealed it to you, it's because you're not drawing near with a pure heart, wanting to know what He's called you to do. You're not surrendering your life. 
you're going to church in a religious fashion. Because God wants to do this. God is doing this. God will do this. God cannot lie. He wants to equip you to do the work of the ministry with Him. Nobody is called to be a pew setter. Nobody is called to walk in the world and just come in on Sunday morning and go, okay, teach me, preach to me, play a little bit of guitar to me, entertain me. We're all the body of Christ. Not children getting tossed around. You know, I can tell my little grandson and my grandbabies about anything and they believe me. I can trick them into going and doing about anything. I can tell them I got a fly in my hand. They look and then I go like that and scare them and... I mean, it's just trickery. It's just cunning. It's, it's fun and games. Unless it's dealing with your soul, then it becomes a deception that could lead you to hell. It could keep you from the blessing of God and the work of God and the growth. And you stay a little child. And we're always supposed to be on the growth, not rehearsing the elementary principles of salvation all the time. When that happens and you have to, you know, I've got a buddy that's, in the nursing home and he's got brain damage from having a, a head-on collision with a truck when he was on a moped and he don't remember he has to be retrained and retrained and retrained and retold so see when this happens we have to say god what is going on that i have to learn this stuff over and over and over and over and I, and I keep having to do it. I need to ask you, God, because you love me. You died. I'm covered in the blood. You have the supply. You have the gifting. You have the power. And I need to be the one that surrenders to that work instead of chasing my tail around, instead of chasing the world around, instead of letting men or the devil trick me and deceive me. I want to be equipped to do the work of the ministry, and I want to become that perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he says in 15, again, what are we supposed to be doing? Speaking the truth in love, that we may all grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. We're growing up into Christ. We're looking to him as our supply, from whom the whole body... Joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Notice the whole body, every joint, every person is supposed to be supplying. Doing our part in the ministry. We all supply. According to the effective working by which every part does its share. Causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We're all ministering our gift to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That's what we're called to do. Seeing that you've received it, we're supposed to minister to one another, looking to give ourselves away, not always looking just to get. That's flesh. That's flesh. So back to our text, 1 Peter 4, 10. As each one has received the gift, minister, serve one another as good stewards, good treasurers, good attendants of the manifold grace of God. Now manifold means divers or various it means various ver varies of uh, varies of character there, there's a lot of different in fact he said the hallelujah bible said the favor manifold favor of god it looks differently listen it i always call grace god's riches at christ's expense and guess what that that is a lot there's a lot of inheritance there there's a lot of grace there but we use our gift to minister all of that grace to others, hand it out to others, tell others about it, reflect the love of Christ. Do you know what your gift is? Are you walking in your gifting? Are you asking God to teach you your gifting and, and to, to be the supply and the strength 
in all of your ability for your gifting? Are you trusting in him as you speak to other people about his kingdom? Do you have a desire to see souls saved? See, I think if the Holy Spirit of God is ruling and reigning in our life, the Holy Spirit is here to equip people to do the work of the ministry so that souls can be saved, so that Christ's blood is not wasted, trampled underfoot. So that's what he's called all of us to do as members of the body of Christ. Now, before we close, let's just go on back over. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. I can't help it. I know. I've spent so much time on it. I want to go over and look at it. And, you know, there was a lot of chaos going on in the church in Corinth. And Paul writes a letter to them and to try to explain the gifting. And I just want to read through it a little bit. And we'll take a few more minutes just to finish up talking about uh, the gifts that we've been given and how we should be ministering to one another so that we can all be equipped, we can all be encouraged, we can all be a perfect um, resemblance of Christ to a dead and dying world together. Because when they see our love for one another, they'll know we're his disciples. So look here, 12. Now concerning spirituals, your Bible might say gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual, it's supernatural enablements, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant, unlearned, uninformed. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. All of us were led in some way following something. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That must be a speaking gift too. But the Holy Spirit is what does all the work. And no one can rightly or perfectly or even attempt to make Jesus Lord without the Spirit of God. He baptizes you into the body. He gives you gifts. He equips you. He's the one that leads you, guides you, teaches you. He's your supply. He's your strength. It's impossible to say Jesus is Lord or to live as Jesus is Lord without the Spirit of God. There are a diversity of spirituals or gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, different services, but the same Lord. We're all serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are diversities of activities. But it is the same God who works all in all. His power, His might. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. It's not for you. It's not to draw attention. not so you can be a rock star. That's why when you see these people on TV and they're, they're touching people on the head, that they, they, they were not called to that. It's of the flesh. If it were real, it wouldn't draw attention to them. It wouldn't be their ministry. In fact... In the, in, in the book of James, when James says it, he says, call the elders, plural. Not one person, elders, plural, if you're sick. And the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail, avail as much, so that nobody ever knows who even had the gift, and the, and the glory goes to God for anybody that was healed. Not to one person. For the prophet of all, verse 8, for to one, we're in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8, for to one is given the word of wisdom, supernatural wisdom about something, through the Spirit. To another is the word of knowledge. You would know something uh, that you shouldn't know, but God gives you knowledge of it through the same Spirit. To another, faith. Look at that. See, we all have faith, but there's also a gift of faith. There's people, you ever see those people that uh, have, just have the gift of faith? Things are going wrong, and they go, oh, just it's all right, just pray, just keep moving, we're going to get this done, it's going to be fine. And it's like a time where God gives you a spiritual manifestation of where you can just believe, even when things are going wrong, you keep moving, and it keeps, them, keeps you moving forward by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. 
to another different kinds of tongues. Don't even mention tongues now. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink one Spirit." For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am a hand, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? Where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? We'd all be one big nose, right? Wouldn't that look cool, a nose walking down the road? If there was a foot, you wouldn't want to smell it. Yeah. I think uh, one of the best things i ever seen was uh, an analogy. If you're walking down a railroad track, Right? and you're looking that way and a train's coming behind you and you don't see a train but your ears hear the train and your ears say there's a train coming you say I don't see one I'm an eye I don't see one and he ran over because you won't listen to the ears listen we're all given different gifts using them together my ears tell me there's a train coming so my feet can make quick and get off the tracks whether my eye sees it or not I should listen and trust the rest of the body. The problem is we're so separated and decimated by the devil that we don't understand what we're supposed to be doing in the body of Christ. So we don't work together and minister our gifts to one another as good stewards of God for the manifold grace of God. We don't do it in that manner where I'm trying to make sure the work of the ministry gets done. I'm trying to make sure I'm encouraging and edifying others which is what the body should be doing. When the door is slamming and my eyes see my hands getting ready to get caught, my arm yanks my hand out. We work together. We help one another. And that's the way the body should be doing. It's the perfect analogy that's being given here. And we're all the body of Christ. And if we're listening to the wisdom of God and allowing the Spirit to lead us, we'll take care of one another and nobody should want for anything. Verse 20. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Notice what's going on there. It's because sometimes somebody will go, Well, oh, look at them. Look at them. They we don't nah, we don't need them. They ain't got nothing to give to the body. Would you say that to your foot? Then you couldn't walk. The feet stinking, I don't like it. Get away from the body. So we got to be careful with that. But notice it's one saying to the other. The next line is 22. No much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it. He's great in your, in your weakness. That there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ. And members individually. That's about the third time he said that. We're all the same. Anytime you see you are and we are, you know who you are in Christ. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps. That's a gift of helps. Administration, gift of administration. Variety of tongues. Now notice these rhetorical questions. Verse 29. Are all apostles? Question mark. No. 
Not everybody is sent forth. Are all prophets? No, not everybody is a teacher. Are all teachers? No, not everybody equips and explains the word of God. Are all workers of miracles? No, they're not. Do all have gifts of healing? No, it's really easy. Do all speak in tongues? Absolutely not. All do not speak in tongues. And anybody that says you have to speak in tongues in order to be saved is from the pit of hell and haven't read their Bible. And they need to read their Bible. Not all speak in tongues. No more than all are teachers. And no more than all have gifts of healing. Different gifts. All members of the same body. Members individually with differing gifts. Different parts. Do all interpret? No, but if somebody speaks in tongues, you need an interpreter. But earnestly desire, look at this. This is what Paul is telling you you should do. Earnestly desire, lust after the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. And then you have... 1 Corinthians 13. What is that? The love chapter. This is the most excellent way. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Because God is love. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, give everything away, and though I give my body to be burned, I'll die for Jesus, but have not love, it profits me nothing. It's being done without supernatural manifestation. It's being done without the Spirit. Because if you have not love, you have not God. So you must not have the Spirit. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now somebody once read this to me and said, now put your name in there. And I'm like, no. Because when you put your name in there and think about, am I Christ-like? Am I like love? It really shows you the place that we need to be. Listen, we need to be there. We need to understand that apart from God, we can do nothing. Apart from His Spirit, apart from His love, apart from His work, we can do absolutely nothing. And we have no power to perform it except for a surrendered vessel that says, here I am, Lord, send me in your power, in your strength, with your message, with your word, for your glory, for such a time as this. Verse 8, love never fails. Boy, I do. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Sometimes people teach wrong. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Sometimes, or sometimes they will, won't they? They're going to cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Is it gone yet? You guys know anything? See, it's not gone yet, is it? The only one they want to get rid of is the tongues. But knowledge is still here. It hasn't vanished away. For, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. See, God gives us any more, we'll pop. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. Now, just think about it just for a minute. If that which is perfect was the Holy Scriptures, everything else would have done away with. See, that's a verse that they try to use to cessationists that say that the gifts are gone, that there's no need for spiritual gifts anymore because they're gone, because that which is perfect, canonized Scripture, 66 books by 40 different authors written by the Holy Spirit, they say that now there's no need for spiritual gifts because that which is perfect is already here. Well, then, why can't we prophesy perfectly? Why don't we have knowledge perfectly if it's really here perfectly? It's not. It's talking about when Christ returns, we won't need any of these things anymore. We won't have to know in part because we'll see him and be faced with it. Watch what he goes on to say. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. 
I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. No longer like that. Remember, we talked about that earlier. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Notice he's talking about a future time when that which is perfect comes. You know, at the time, what the mirrors were? Shiny brass. They would take metal and shine it. They could see dimly. See, that doesn't work for us now because we look in a mirror and we see almost perfectly. We even have those magnifying mirrors where you can see our face better. But then they just shine some brass up and they go, ooh, and they would go like, mm. Remember Duff's? Remember when they, you guys, anybody remember Duff's or those mirrors that make you skinnier and make you fatter? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's what Duff's used to have. You go in one side and they make you look real skinny. You come out the other side and after you ate, they make you look real big. Remember those mirrors? That's, the, that's what we're talking about. But see, we don't want to look into the perfect law of liberty, this mirror, the perfect law of liberty, and ignore it. And that's what we're seeing today. Now, I know in part, right now I know in part, there's still knowledge, I know in part. It's in part, he just said that in verse 10, 9 and 10. But then... So he said then twice, like it's a future time. I shall know just as I am also known. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. And I know some of you say charity, but the greatest of these is love. Now I brought you all the way here because this is next week's memory verse. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. The Bible tells us, instructs us, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. It's actually desire spirituals, but especially that you may prophesy. That's your, that's your scripture memory verse for next week. Pursue love and desire spirituals or spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. We're supposed to desire them. We're supposed to, we're supposed to be pursuing God's, pursuing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit of love, which is God's character. And desire spirituals. Have you ever talked to God about a spiritual gift? We're supposed to desire them. We want to walk in them. Why, Greg? Because that's how we equip and build up one another. That's how the work of the ministry gets done. When I begin to let the Spirit use me and I, and I, and I minister to one another with, uh, as a good steward of God, the manifold grace of God. Other than that, the body is just there. Members all over just doing what they want. Just, and, and we're not knitted and equipped together till we come to the unity of the faith. Because some are working and some are just going to church. But the body, the true people that believe in Jesus are supposed to be looking to grow, looking to, to, to allow the supernatural enablement of the, of the Spirit to use you to serve others, to encourage others, to build others up, to equip them. So you need to talk to God about your gifting. I'm going to stop there. You can read all of 14. I would encourage it because some of the nonsense that's going on in churches today is all covered in 12, 13, and 14. And if you read it and look at it and ask God to show it to you, you'll see that the way that people are living their Christian lives is not following what the Spirit of God is doing. We're all individuals, but we're not becoming members unified to do the work of the ministry. All we're doing is individuals. And the devil takes us out and decimates us. Instead of building us up, building us together and knitting us together so we can do the work of the ministry and encourage one another and take care of one another, we're just kind of out there by ourselves and we go to church and meet with people. So how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. No, you're not. You're lying. But we got to put on that old smiley face on Sunday morning. Doing good. I used to say it all the time. I'd say, how you doing? Doing good. Would you tell me if you wasn't? 
I just quit saying it to people because they just tell another one. See, we're supposed to be able to speak to people. When you ask how somebody's doing, it shouldn't be a hello. When you say, how you doing today? It should be like if they got 20 minutes, they want to talk to you so you can encourage them, you probably should sit down. If you want to say hi, say hi. But when you say how you doing, you should be willing to be a shoulder to listen and counsel them. But you know what? When somebody gives you counsel and it's biblical and you don't have ears to hear it, then you're deceiving yourself. Because we should be following the counsel. Has God said anything to you lately? All you got to do is write it down. I carry pens in my pocket so when God speaks, I can write it down. Very important. If he speaks to you and you walk away and forget it and he's already spoke, you're like, I know God told me something and I forget what he said. I keep a tablet of paper on the dash of my truck. I got stuff written all over everything. That's the way I think. You might be able to remember what God told you. I can't. Sometimes i got to write it down. Whatever method you use, don't let the truth change. Whatever method you use to, 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 to get before God and pray, to get before God and surrender, to get before God and ask Him what your gifting is, to get before some other men or some other women, if you're a woman, and ask them to counsel you and help you be part of the body of Christ, Ask the Holy Spirit to move in your life today. We need to get serious about being the body of Christ and members of the body of Christ and allowing Him to be the head because we are in the last milliseconds of the last days. Now, I know you know, everybody's been saying that. Don't be a scoffer. That's what scoffers say. They're the ones that say they've been saying that forever. We should know the truth and that he's coming back to take the chosen home very quickly. And we should say, Maranatha, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But while he is long-suffering and still is not willing that any should perish, we need to learn how to be the body of Christ and learn how to minister. Since we've received our gift, we should learn how to minister to one another as good stewards of God, the manifold grace of God. Yeah. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your gifting. Lord, if we've received it, we pray that you would enable us with your strength, your power, your might, your spirit, that you would give us that measure of faith to trust you that we can go out and minister to one another as good stewards your manifold grace. Thank you for that grace. We pray that souls would come to salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord bless you.